the timeline that you guys all worked out during our Easter egg hunt. Um, we're going to have a little look through that in a bit more detail. So Jesus' life is talked about in the New Testament and the Bible. There's four books which are called the Gospels, which were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Two of those were Jesus' disciples, and the other two spoke to other people who knew him, who'd seen what was going on, to write their stories. We know loads about Jesus' birth. We know about him at Christmas time, and we talk about that each year at Christmas. Um, then we don't know very much at all. We know a couple of little bits, but we don't know very much until he was about 30. And then he started doing miracles, and lots of people chose to follow him. And he came to tell the Jews that God wasn't just there for the Jews, but God was actually there for everybody. So as Jesus travelled around speaking and doing miracles, loads and loads of people started to follow him. And they were telling their friends about how good he was um, and what they wanted to do. Both the disciples, um, who knew him really well, and those that just knew about him, um, traveled to hear him speak. Um, some people started to say that he was the Messiah, which was the promised person that the Jews had been waiting for, who was going to come and save them. And the Jews believed that the Messiah would come along and fight the Romans and be their king, overthrow all the people that were against them. We're going to pick up the story now as Jesus is drawing near to the end of his time on earth. He's probably about 33 years old now, and he's been traveling around for three years. He now chooses to go to Jerusalem and get ready for the festival of Passover. So we're going to follow the story through short little passages from the Bible and see what happens. And each of those is going to be linked to the pictures that we put in the right order earlier. So the first picture of the palm branches and the donkey. So this is from Matthew's Gospel in the Bible, and it says, As they approached Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt tied by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large, large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So many people were really excited when Jesus came into the city. They thought he was the new king. They thought he was going to come and save them. When they put their coats on the ground, it was like making a red carpet. Um, the crowd would have known the words about the king coming riding on a donkey, but they were expecting him to come and overthrow the Romans. They were not expecting um, what happened next. So then the next picture that we had was the one with the silver co coins. So one of Jesus' disciples, who was called Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priest and he asked, what are you willing to give me? if I deliver Jesus over to you. So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So not everybody was happy to have Jesus coming in as king. The chief priests, they wanted to be the most important people. They didn't want Jesus to be. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And Judas was one of Jesus' disciples, one of his special friends. But he chose to betray him, um, and the chief priest paid him the money to help them to capture Jesus. So that was quite a horrible thing to happen to Jesus. So the next picture we've got 
is the one with the Last Supper. And this is from Matthew's Gospel. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many of the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus celebrated this special meal, which was called the Passover meal, with his friends. During the meal, he talked about Judas who was going to betray him. Um, and he also talked about the wine being the symbol of his blood, because he was going to die. And the bread being a symbol of his body being broken. They weren't actually the body and the and the blood, but it was symbolic. He told all of his disciples to remember him whenever they shared the special meal together. And that's why churches today take communion. This is a special meal where we eat bread and wine, or some people have grape juice, to remember Jesus dying for us. So following on from the Last Supper, um, they went to a place called Gethsemane, um, where Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John along with him. And he was quite upset and troubled. And he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sor sorrow to the point of death. So he asked them to stay there and keep watch while he prayed. Je Jesus wanted to talk to God alone. He knew that he was going to be killed soon. And he was sad about it. He asked God to make it so he didn't have to die. But he also said to God, not my will, but yours be done. This way, he was agreeing to God's plan, even though it made him feel sad. Because Jesus was both God and man at the same time, which is a very confusing concept, but the God part of him was willing to die because he loved the people and wanted to save them. The human part of him didn't want to experience the pain of dying on a cross. But I know lots of parents will say, if their child's really ill or whatever, they often say, I wish I could take that pain away from them. I wish I could take it on to me instead. And that's what Jesus did for each one of us. Jesus took that pain uh, so that we didn't have to. So then we're going to move to the next picture, um, which is the one with the crown of thorns on. So this is Matthew 27 this comes from. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus um, and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they mocked him, they took off the road and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Now to me, that sounds so horrible. I can't imagine that. I don't really want to imagine that. And because Jesus was the son of God, he could have stopped them from hurting him. But he let them carry on. Because even though he hadn't done anything wrong, Jesus was taking the punishment for the wrong things that any person has ever done or ever would do. And that includes you and me. Right, how are you children getting on? Brilliant. Well, we've got a couple more to go and then we're going to have another song. So do you want to sit down for a minute, wait for a couple more, and then we will do the song soon. So then we have... Um, from John's Gospel, this is where Pilate handed Jesus over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers took Jesus to a hill on top, a top of a hill outside the city. They used huge nails to nail him to a wooden cross. And he died a few hours later. God let, Jesus let people, um, let him die because God loves us so much. 
He was willing to let Jesus be punished for the wrong things that we do. And even though it hurt Jesus badly, Jesus was willing to do what God the Father asked him to. So the next picture we've got is the spear. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who was being crucified with Jesus, and then the other man because they weren't dead yet. But when they came to Jesus and found he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But instead, one of the soldiers put a spear in Jesus' side to make sure that he was dead. And then we talk about burying Jesus. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea, who was called Joseph. He had become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. So that was a brave thing for Joseph to go and ask for. The men that had killed Jesus didn't believe that he was the son of God, but Joseph did believe that and wanted him to have a proper burial. Joseph wrapped Jesus' body in cloth and buried him in the tomb cut from rock. Joseph went away sad because of Jesus' death and wondered what would happen next. When um, after that, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going into the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men, that they fainted. So the stone that was rolled in front of the tomb was huge, and probably weighed more than a car. After Jesus was buried, special soldiers were assigned to stand guard at the tomb, but these men were no match for God's angel. It took just one angel to roll the stone away. And then we come to the last picture. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know what you are looking for, looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. When two women came to the tomb of Jesus, they were surprised. The heavy stone was rolled aside and the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. The tomb was empty just like the egg in our picture. And the angel told him, he has risen. Jesus has come back to life. And this is the promise that Jesus had made at the Last Supper that he would die but come back to life to show those who believed in him that they could live forever too. And there's a verse in the Bible that said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So what about you? That was a potted history of the last week of Jesus' life. God wants you to live with him in heaven forever. He's used Jesus to make the way for you to do this. What will you do with the knowledge that Jesus died for you? When you eat chocolate at Easter, will you think about the chips and the bunnies? Or will you think about Jesus? So, I don't think it's fair of me to ask you guys what it means for you if I don't tell you what Jesus dying means for me. So, I didn't believe in Jesus um, growing up, um, I didn't believe in God or Jesus or any of it. Um, I went out with a guy when I was probably about 17 and he was a Christian and I found it all very weird. I didn't understand why he went to church, I didn't understand why he felt that God had a say in his life because I didn't believe in this God. So I told him it was all a load of rubbish, as any good girlfriend would do. Um, and he suggested that I read the Bible um, and he gave me one of these Bibles to read that had a little bit to read each day and said that when I'd read the Bible I was free to tell him that it was a load of rubbish. So I started off reading the Bible believing still that it was a load of rubbish. There were people that lived to stupidly old, 500 and 600 and stuff in Noah's time and I just thought, I just didn't get it, it just didn't make sense to me. But as I carried on 
reading through the Bible, my mind gradually began to change. And I began to realise that actually this did mean something for my life. That this was real and relevant to me. And although there's plenty in the Bible that I didn't understand, although there was plenty of stuff that didn't make sense in a humanly possible way, it did make sense in a God possible way. So I ended up um, deciding, I was at university by this point, and I wasn't with that guy anymore, but I ended up at university deciding that I probably could afford to go to church on a Sunday morning. I reckon I had that much time in my day, so that's what I committed to. I thought I was committing to Jesus, but I think really I was just committing to Sunday mornings at church. So it took about six months of going to church on a Sunday morning before I actually understood that God had a plan for my life, that believing in God could change more than just my Sunday mornings. Believing in God and following him could change my entire life. I very much intended to have a high-flying career, like I said the other week, and be earning lots and lots of money by now. But that wasn't the plan that God had for my life. I've managed, it changed so much. If you'd seen me then, I was lost. I was looking for love from boyfriends and boyfriends and boyfriends. Um, and I wasn't looking for love from God. And yet, actually, that's what I needed. Once I found out that God loved me, then I could be um, confident. I could be a whole person. I didn't need to seek that constant approval from everybody else. I had confidence, I had a purpose, and I had a life full of love. And then I have chosen to end up working in a place like this, where the salary is not quite what I was anticipating. However, I get the opportunity to tell other people about Jesus. And for me, that is what my purpose is. That's what God's asking me to do now. So I am very happy to chat more about that and more about the changes in my life with other people afterwards, feel free to ask.